Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence with psychiatrist Bernard David Beitman, MD. Dr. Beitman is the founder of The Coincidence Project. The project encourages people like you to tell each other coincidence stories. To learn more about Dr. Beitman's work, put Connecting with Coincidence in your web browser. You'll find his book, his Psychology Today blog, and the interviews from this podcast. And now your host, Bernard Beitman, MD. Welcome to Connecting with Coincidence. I am your host, Dr. Bernard Beitman, MD. I'm a psychiatrist. I study the mind and brain in its physical and cultural context and meaningful coincidences like synchronicity and serendipity provide clues to how our minds and our brains connect deeply to our bodies, other people, nature, and our environments. Meaningful coincidences occur in all aspects of life. You just have to expect them. Now, if you don't see them, they're not there. If you're not ready to see them, you're likely not going to see them unless one <laughs> hits you right in the face, which sometimes they do. You can pre-order my new book coming out in September of this year. Uh, Meaningful Coincidences is its name, How and Why Synchronicity and Serendi Serendipity Happen. The order links are in the text below. Now for my coincidence story today, um, let's title this Machine as Object. The basic common form of coincidences is thinking of something, some mental event, matching some environmental event, some object in the environment that other people can see. So this one is called machine as object, something to match in a mind, a mind with a machine. Machines seem to respond to human emotions. And here's an example. At 10, 10 a.m. on June 25th, 2010, in the Oval, Oval Office of the White House, President Barack Obama heard the news that the Supreme Court supported the continuation of the Affordable Care Act. It was the signature act of his presidency. He and his staff celebrated. At 10.30 a.m., photographs by the official staff photographer showed that the clock in the office, in the Oval Office, had stopped at 10.10 a.m. How'd that happen? Well, we'll get into that maybe about probability fields and changes in randomness that have something to do with influencing things around us. We are connected to our machines and our machines are connected to us. And sometimes there's no better place to see that on Zoom than because I've seen it before, other people have too, when there's high emotion between the participants on Zoom, sometimes Zoom doesn't work so well. Maybe you've noticed that yourselves. Our guest today is Adam Curry. Um, and Adam has done a lot of things in his life. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about him. Uh, he is a tech entrepreneur in California. His background is in traditional hardware and software startups and in the scientific study of consciousness, having spent over 10 years in its research community at places like Princeton's University's Pear Lab. Currently, he is a, he is a partner at a boutique venture studio focused on the applications of non-standard model physics. So Adam, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dr. Batman. I'm glad, we, I'm glad we got this together. Uh, there's a lot that I wanna be able to talk with you about, Adam, but please tell us uh, a very good coincidence story that you've told me. I'll tell you one that happened recently. I, I think enough time has passed that I can uh, talk about it. It's the story of how I met my ex-girlfriend. And <clears throat> in short, about a year ago, I was watching my favorite television show. Uh, it was a, a series on HBO. And I saw one of the characters and uh, something about this character really stuck out to me. So I took a screenshot of it and I put it in the vision board folder of my computer. 
You have a vision board. I have a vision board folder. So it's, I find it easier to create than an actual physical vision board. Yes, but the, um, same, the same idea. The same idea, right. And, and please tell those who don't know what a vision board is. Okay, so the things that you want to bring into your life, you put on your vision board or in your vision board folder. Uh, they can be literal things. They could also be symbolic things. In this case, the screenshot of this character was symbolic of uh, a, a good romantic partner for me. Let's put it that way. All right. Um, fast forward six months, I'm looking through my vision board folder and I remember that I put this picture there. And I thought, hmm. So I started my daily meditation that day and uh, kind of popped into my head, uh, just thinking about, uh, thinking about the idea of uh, you know, uh, finding a partner, I suppose, of dating again. And uh, about a few hours later, I get a number of messages on Instagram. And it's from the woman who played this character uh, in this TV show. And she had, at some point, she had seen a documentary that I was in and was very fascinated with the ideas that I was discussing, some of the ideas which we'll discuss today, and wanted to reach out and, and introduce herself. And so within you know, uh, a couple of days, we had met and then you know, began dating. Um, <laughs> that's, a, that's probably one of my better ones. That's a, that, that's a good one. And I shared that uh, story um, with someone, won't get into the details of it, who was also kind of involved with a, somebody that we called X, who sounded like she was a famous person of some kind. And as her mother was um, doing a, a word puzzle, as the person I'm telling you about was going to a psychic, she came, her, muzzle di, her, mother, her mother put a word puzzle together that had psychic, um, the kind of short name for this, this actress and uh, a connection with the patient's uh, sister who is a part of this story. Mm. Uh, having, and, that, and this was at the same time the, the person I'm telling you about uh, telling me this was going to the psychic. So that happened around the same time. But the, yeah, it was interesting. And this was a lower probability one than what you just described because yeah. it was the third person involved uh, and not directly the way you, you and this other person and this actress was, were involved. But that's a harder one. And uh, one of the things I want to get to one of these days is be able to, how do, how do we understand these low prob really low probability ones? But let, let's start with yours, your vision board. And I mean, that's a pretty good one too. I mean, thinking about her, I mean, one of the common forms of coincidence is, is thinking about somebody and they contact you. But that's it's right. usually somebody you know uh, somehow. But in some way, Adam Curry got to know this actress before <laughs> she called you is, is my way of thinking about it. how do you think about consciousness and this coincidence of yours well in broad strokes i believe that consciousness proactively creates the synchronicities that we experience you know you can listeners to your show are no stranger i'm sure to kind of two ways to understand synchronicity or coincidence one is that it's all truly random there's no proactive involvement of our own mind in creating the phenomena, it just happens and we kind of pull it together in a way that seems meaningful to us. In other words, it's sort of a psychological um, effect that unfolds in us. Another way of looking at it is that consciousness is at some level creating these uh, events in our life. Um, and that might be because we're holding something in our mind. That might also be because we are creating reflections of some issue that might be in our subconscious mind. Uh, it could be that these meaningful events are happening. They, they, they come to us because of some implication for the future. In other words, there might be uh, effects that are coming from the future that are happening now and we experience them as the sort of organized um, meaningful coincidence or it could be all of those. Um, but I believe that consciousness is a proactive agent in physical reality. And that's not just confined to the laboratory bench, but that is also in our, in our lives writ large. 
Well, you describe it uh, as having some intentionality, consciousness. Um, is that what you mean? I think that very, yes, very often coincidences come about through intense intentionality. I believe that you had uh, Dean Radin on your program recently. Yes. And maybe he shared his unbelievable coincidence story of the gentleman who was trying to manifest himself. It was a guy that was trying to manifest Dean. Yeah, and it was in, a pre, in a previous show, not the last one. And I, I wrote I wrote it up in Psychology Today too. I mean, the wall between the. I mean, we're not. I don't know if we can go through the whole thing, but maybe you can summarize it. It's a long story. Um, you know, refer to the episode that um, that Bernard did with uh, with Dean Radin. But essentially, there was a gentleman who was trying to manifest Dean Radin. He went through an an intense intention exercise, uh, visualizing him. Uh, meeting him and meeting him and eventually dean moved into a new lab space which is on the shared a wall with this gentleman and uh, they met in the hallway as they were right. moving in dean knocked on the door yeah. <laughs> to introduce himself and the guy almost collapsed <laughs> yeah <laughs> much of what i do in terms of the research stuff and my own perspectives uh come from dean uh he's you know he's really the, the grandfather of a lot of this work ah oh, nice to know that yeah Nice to know that uh, he's he's a great guy and uh, yes he is really articulate and makes stuff very clear. Uh, there's a lot we could talk about with him, but uh, your views of consciousness uh, is what I want to be able to spend a little time with. And what we talked about before the show is probability fields and randomness and probability fields and intentionality. Somehow, in the way uh, Adam Curry thinks about uh, synchronicity, for example, they it, they come together, uh, randomness and intentionality in a probability field. Mm -hmm. I think that's a good way of putting it. Um, you know, when you're talking about probability fields and consciousness and how they come together, uh, it tends to be abstract. It's a lot of theorizing. I, I try to put it this way uh, up front. Um, did you lock your car this morning? No. Okay, um, you're supposed to say yes. Let's say that uh, let's let's say, say that um, okay. <laughs> let's say that you locked your car. Right? Let's say okay. Hey, I locked my car. Okay. okay. Now this is something that we do without thinking about it, right? It's very automatic. And you go, you know, throughout your day, and then we have our podcast, and I ask you if you locked your car, and you think you did because you always do, but you don't specifically remember locking your car. And now I call this into question. I'm saying, well. You know, it's Mercury retrograde. Uh, you were up early. Uh, you've gone through a lot today. You know, maybe you just overlooked it. You know, maybe you were bringing something large into your in your home, and uh, you just didn't go back. And you know, I can talk you into, in your own mind, reducing the probability that that event happened in the past. Yeah. I've done I've done that to myself many times. Yep. Now uh, a very like traditional perspective on this would be, well, it's all in your mind, right? And my perspective would be, well, it's all in your mind, but that actually affects the physical world. That, that affects the probability that the car door is locked when you go look, look at it again. So in other words, I think that consciousness is, I believe that the physical world to some extent is downstream of consciousness. Uh, there's some interaction between our minds and, and matter, the physical world. Um, we're used to thinking about the future in terms of it being a probability function of the present, meaning it's very likely that in five minutes, you and I will, st will still be having this discussion, but it's not 100%. There's an outside chance that the power is cut or I lose internet connection, right? And so, you know, call it odds of one in 500. So it's not exactly 100%. And then there's all these other potential things that could interfere with us speaking in the next five minutes. So we understand the future to be a probability function of the present. Uh, an asteroid might hit in five minutes, but it's such a low probability as to be essentially zero. <clears throat> and so I, I do believe that consciousness is capable of affecting those probability fields um, to bring to the present moment those types of things that need to happen, those events, those situations, those decisions, those people, those opportunities, 
uh, that make a probability, a, one of the probability functions become realized in the present moment in the future. You could maybe look at it, think of it as like, from the point of view of now, the present moment, the only time that's actually real, there's a cone of probability that uh, goes like forward in time. And there's probably also a cone of probability that goes backwards in time too. It may not be that the past is as set in stone as we think in the same way that I've never actually seen the future. I've only seen the present moment. Well, neither have I seen the past. I've only seen the present moment. And I have a memory, which is subject to being wrong of the past. And I have a, an assumption of the future subject to being wrong. So <clears throat> it could be that consciousness is sort of affecting both sides of the emanation of, of probability functions from the present moment to create this, this uh, current reality in which we live to some extent. And I have, to, I have to put that caveat there because when people start saying things like you create your own reality, well, tell that to people with chronic pain or with a reality that's not you know, something that they would like. Uh, or in war-torn areas. Or in war-torn areas. It's, it's not as simple as that, right? So I always put that caveat there. Well, you've got to. Uh, there, I vote for the idea <coughs> that there's something real here. <coughs> there is a real world. There is like physical reality. I mm -hmm. vote for that. I mm -hmm. mean, we, we can break it down into quantum pieces. Yeah, uh, quantum it's, uh, clouds. But the way we have to function, it looks like there's a reality here. And that's part of the reason to be on Earth if we're beings that are can be disembodied which so many people think we can be being on earth in a three-dimensional place is all part of a reality but there's more to sure. it than that <clears throat> i get confused when you say almost the consciousness does something it makes it happen uh, consciousness is a tough word we use it in a lot of different ways but when we were talking earlier, consciousness is kind of, uh, is an information field, is the kind of the way you were talking about it, or, or sources of information. But it come, but probability field is influencing consciousness. So I come up with this idea of psychosphere, a mm. mental a mental atmosphere, and I keep it here on Earth because there's enough confusion about reality on Earth not to talk about the universe, which to me is a little on the large side. So I can't conceptualize that. So the I mean, some people do, but I would prefer to think there's a holographic representation of the universe in the psychosphere. And within the psychosphere, there are the kind of eddies and flows and probability fields that you're talking about. And mm -hmm. within that psychosphere, we can make connections with each other the way you did with that actress, that your intention made that connection with her. Mm. Uh, it's, and it fit with something of hers because she was needing to have a, a boyfriend at the same time too. And this guy was sounding interesting. So there's little bells went off when she saw your, what, your video uh, when you were talking about <laughs> stuff. And she could, she would intuitively, which means blaming what we don't know, but unconsciously or subconsciously, she recognized you mm -hmm. as, what, as somebody who's already been there with her mm -hmm. without really knowing that, in their conscious and consciousness that her conscious awareness that you were there. Yeah, I think that's perhaps a better way of putting it. Um, it, it really starts to make sense when you understand that re reality is like consensus reality. Yeah. And it's something like a, um, a Venn diagram where individual patterns on reality can overlap. And to the extent that they do is the extent to which things can trans meaningful things can transpire between them. <laughs> Yeah, it's so nice when they overlap. <laughs> yeah. I've had a lot of problems. With, I've had a lot of problems when they don't. I mean, right. <laughs> oh no, I missed that one too. And you know, one of the, I want to see what you think about this idea, this interpersonal idea that that's just here on this planet between each other, and we are doing some version of it that just you and I, we each are trying to put the other person in a role that the, we want that other person to play for us. So when those are compatible, I want to play it, you want to play it, then we, it goes very well. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, and this has happened to me recently, and I said, I don't want this anymore. She was putting me in roles that, no, it became more and more uncomfortable. Mm 
Mm. How does that fit with ideas about conscious, your ideas of consciousness? Well, I think maybe a takeaway from my ideas about consciousness or these ideas about consciousness is that yeah. how an individual subjectively relates to something or someone is really an ontological question for them, right? It, it tends to make that thing real. Makes that thing real. Yeah. Yeah. The way they it, relate mm -hmm. makes it happen. Yes. Yes. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a story that I'm really fond of. We like stories. Yeah. I have a colleague um, named Marsha, who's a retired scientist in Sedona. Uh, Marsha, uh, very special woman. I love her. She has a large backyard and the backyard is full of raccoons. And being a retired scientist uh, and kind of given to mad science like you and I, she uh, thought it would be interesting to connect one of those automatic food pellets that at random times spit out a pellet of food. Okay. And instead of the, the um, predetermined timer, she used a quantum random number generator, oh, gosh. which is to say that it was purely random. It was informed by something physical in the world. It's not predictable. And therefore, given the research we're talking about, it's susceptible to the influence of consciousness. Okay, so here's, here's the apparatus. Random number generator, thing of food, randomly spits out these pellets in the middle of the backyard. She sets up a video camera and she just watches, okay? So, <laughs> Here comes the first raccoon, right? Saunters into the, the yard, smells that there's food, is trying to get at it, you know, uh, using its raccoon hands, can't seem to figure it out. At some point, the raccoon is walking, I think uh, clockwise three times around the machine and out comes the pellet of food. And she said that she could see like a light bulb go off in his raccoon mind. And he's like, I figured it out. <laughs> I just have to walk three times clockwise around the, around the thing and out comes the pellet of food. So sure enough, he does it again and it happens and he does it again and it happens. <clears throat> so oh, it's it, not, it happened each yes, time. Oh. Because the raccoon developed a way of relating to something in the physical world. He, he created his own heuristic uh, that is plausible to him so that when he repeats it, the phenomena happens. Wow. Okay. There's nothing special about walking around this thing three times. It's literally a connection that was made in, in the mind of the psychology of the raccoon and the, the physical phenomena, yeah, enabled through this um, subconscious, uh, however our, con our consciousness affects these, these bits in the random number generator in just the right way to produce the phenomena, yeah. Um, apparently, she said that the, the plot thickens and uh, the next day, there's a bunch of raccoons and the first raccoon is like showing them how to do it. And so they're all like kind of like orbiting this thing. And I love this story because to me, it symbolizes the power of ritual, which uh, to which we are not immune in our own lives, but that is the source of magic in many ways, right? Um, I think that there's a reason why um, you know, the um, doing a, a, a spell or a ritual or an intention ceremony must be in a special place with people that are also believers that are moving some you know into the forest at night or up in the mountains away from you know the other influence of consensus reality uh, and are engaging in a ritual which has a lot of reason to think that it works because i don't know it's old it was passed down in a leather bound book uh you have to be initiated in order to encant the you know the spells all of this is a way of uh, tricking our own subconscious mind or our own belief systems into permitting the phenomena to happen to permitting the reality uh, the the anomaly to happen um and so <clears throat> you know this is a long story but regarding what you were saying if you or, or somebody is relating to a thing in their life or an individual in a certain way, sure, they have the psychological blinders or filters on seeing them only in this way, but to some extent, they may also be complicit in shaping their behavior. Yes, they are. 
the person being influenced is complicit, you mean? Or the right. person, person? I suppose they both are, right? They yeah. both find themselves in this, this dance. This, this dance, yeah. Mm -hmm. This dance. I mean, that's what I go to conscious dance or whatever you might call it, the uh, five rhythms. And, and part of the way some of us get going is by mirroring each other. And we begin to to mm. to mirror, and then I move something, and then she moves a little something, and then uh, she moves something, I move something, and it's all kind of like intuitive and random would seem, but we are lining each other up to respond to that next move of the other person. Yep. Well, let's let's talk about. Um, I love that. I love that raccoon story. Um, it, it is so um, it is so basic. It's not you didn't have to go through the ritual. You did the ritual human beings and the ritual in the leather bound books. But the the <laughs> they went around three times and that raccoon said, this is it. I mean, she could see the light going on in the raccoon mind. <laughs> I like that because it probably did go on. A light of some kind did go on in that raccoon's mind. And that light changed the probability field of that random number generator so that it made it happen when the random, when the, when the raccoon thought about making sure. it happen. I was, um, you know, growing up, many people would come to me to have me fix their computers and I would show up and I would not really do anything and the computer would just be fixed. And it was like, it was because in their minds, I'm some sort of like wizard. And so they were like, oh, well, Adam will fix it. And in my mind, I'm like, well, these, like, I believe that these things just kind of resolve if you, if you sort of do it right. So I would, you know, poke around at it and then it would just come on and like, there you go. Thank you. I don't know how you did it. <laughs> we did it together. You enabled me to do this for you. My version of something like that was uh, going back and forth between Best Buy and my house. And I had a car that had a six track CD player in it. And I was so mad having to go back and forth between Best Buy and my house several times. And that correlated with the CD player switching CDs when I wasn't trying to switch it. It kept switching, switching, switching. <laughs> And I, what's going on <laughs> like that? And then the problem was resolved uh, that I went to Best Buy for, and the CD went back to its normal functioning. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you know, the, you're familiar with the Pear Lab at Princeton. There was a gentleman named um, John McDonnell. Didn't know him. Um, well, he was the patriarch of McDonnell Douglas Aerospace Company. And uh, he had found that many of the electronics in the cockpits in uh, high intensity situations would fail. And there's this whole log of these anomalous electronics failures that would happen you know, in, in tense situations, let's say. You know, yeah. This is this is the fifties. This is the sixties. This is the seventies. Yeah. A lot of um, aircraft were being experimental aircraft were being um, developed at that time. And so, <clears throat> early on, he came to Bob John, the dean of the engineering school at Princeton, and explained that look, what's going on here? It seems as though there's some sort of unconventional, unexplained connection between the emotional intensity experienced by my pilots and the failure of this equipment. And uh, that, in, in part, was what uh, initiated the, uh, the consciousness research program. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. In part. There was in a, part. There's more to it, but yeah. And he was a, an early funder as well of the research. Well, just so for our audience to know, uh, the Pear Lab at Princeton was um, intended to study, did study uh, a lot of consciousness activities in the world using random number generators to see if there was a change in the random number generators that correlated with the event in the world. So this is kind of a variation, but you, this was a hint about how machines respond to 
uh, what's around the, the pilots. Um, that's a, do you know the story about how the Pear Lab got named the Pear Lab? Um, I know a couple, what, what, what uh, about yourself? Well, the one I know about, and then you tell yours, um, they didn't know what to call the place and somebody, uh, and they're having lunch in the cafeteria and they got a, a dessert of, of pears in, in a dish. <laughs> Let's call it the pear lab. That's the one I heard. What'd you, what'd you get? I, I heard the same. It, in addition to being a great acronym, they also felt that to approach the research in a clinical, austere, um, well, maybe those aren't the right words, but in a, in a way that doesn't treat the subject as human is not going to elucidate the human side of what they're studying. And so uh, pair is playful. Uh, Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research is very serious. And of course the rigor, the, the research was rigorous, but there's, a, there's always a different side of the pair lab. You know, you'd go in and there would be stuffed animals everywhere um, and a big, comfortable orange sofa. And of course, Brenda always there with a big uh, smile to greet you. Uh, and so I think part of the reason why the Pear Lab got such interesting results is because it wasn't a place that made you feel like you were going into a dentist office. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't a traditional clinical setting. It was a place where uh, you could play. You could play, well, just my word. And talking about play, there's a word play involved here too, besides the two potential meanings of pair, Princeton uh, Engineering Anomalous Research uh, and the pair on the cafeteria table. Uh, there's also P-A-I-R, pairing, mm. the pair between a mental event and the machine event. Oh, interesting. I hadn't thought of that before. And of course the lab was really so much, uh, in so many ways, a pair of Bob and Brenda. Uh, and these, you know, they, they talk, they discuss a lot about complementary dualities, right? Um, how, you know, mind and matter are complementary dualities. Of course, those two were very different, but they were very complementary. Um, and the research is based on, you know, the outcome of binary events that can go one way or the other, but they're inexorably balanced in some way. And so we get to yin and yang. And so we get to um, life on earth, Adam. Adam, the first human being, supposedly. Uh, and then he had to have his pair in Eve. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we got was good and evil. So we got black and white. And this, this place, this earth is full, is characterized by light and dark, uh, death and life. Uh, it's these binary things make us here. However, there are continua. And one of the problems that a lot of human beings have is being able to be aware of the polarities and the continua between them at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I, I like to suggest that awareness of coincidences are, increases our ability to do that by noticing environmental and subjective events as being connected with each other as well as apparently separate. I completely concur. In fact, it might even go beyond that. Uh, there's, well, not beyond that perhaps, but um, related to that, you know, you have a pretty big paradox in evolutionary biology about just how unlikely it is that life would have evolved under the conditions that it did. You, know, you account for all the fine-tuned constants uh, and uh, the odds against chance of these various um, <laughs> happy accidents, let's say, that create an evolutionary advantage if, if the story they tell is correct. And it actually ends up making, it's not only unlikely, it's not just cosmically unlikely it's beyond cosmically unlikely um, that you know evolution unfolds in the way that it did and this you know creates the argument for the creationists to say well you know hey maybe there is a, a, a hand in here but I, I think that what you're talking about Dr. Beitman is is maybe a third way of looking at these things uh, not a strictly evolutionary perspective with the happy accidents uh, you know something that you get from strict reductionist materialism 
but neither does it have to be um, neither does it have to be a, a creationist argument in which you know your own agency or the agency of the um, entities is kind of overlooked. But through synchronicity, the organism might be creating the opportunities for its own evolution. And we're talking about meaningful coincidences in our conversation, but these meaningful coincidences are often an invitation to grow, right? It often brings you what you need in terms of your physical well-being, you know, careers and job opportunities and so forth. It also is an opportunity to, uh, to grow in terms of your, um, what really fulfills you. And so it could be that synchronicities are happening, happening at, at levels of basic organisms, you know, maybe the constituents of cells got together through synchronicity because it was in there, it was meaningful and good for them to uh, come together into the unity of a cell and so on and so on and so on. And so if consciousness that is kind of behind that is driving these coincidences to form, um, you know, life on earth uh, and probably elsewhere in the solar system than I mean, in the, in the universe, then you can have uh, your, your um, evolutionary argument. You can have your creation argument. You just have to understand consciousness and the role of teleology, uh, meaningful, you know, meaningness as a driver, uh, meaningfulness as a driver in, in uh, the physical world. And teleology is we're pulled towards the future. And in this case, meaning, and why not make meaning ad adaptation? And increase sure. and increase complexity, um, sure. and then being able to apprehend consciousness, not just have it, but to be able to apprehend it. So it's it's a. I like that very much. You were you and I were talking earlier about um, maybe doing a little experiment because uh, you are in a favor of citizen scientists, as am I. Um, because I am very much in favor of kill. If you see a Buddhist on the Buddha on the road, kill him, because you've got to be able to experience these things yourself and check them out in a scientific way. Yes, and be careful. Talk with other people. Get repeated things. Do what the raccoon did. <laughs> do try it three times. See if it happens again. Uh, that, that's that's testing things out. You've got to be able to do that. But to be able to to learn how to do that. Uh, is an important learn how to use synchronicity that way and serendipity. Um, you're, you've got another experiment for us to consider. I do. Um, you know, as a as a mad scientist, I couldn't. Uh... You don't look like a mad scientist. I'm sorry. That's good though. <laughs> you should have a. Uh, okay, maybe a mad inventor. Go ahead, um, man. A mad inventor is good. Okay. There you go. Um, Hair isn't so crazy. I don't live in a castle in Bavaria. Um, these are the pros. So, okay, so here's the little experiment that I want, I want us to do. And actually it's going to involve every person watching this and every person who ever watches this in the future. Okay, so <clears throat> what we're gonna do is we're going to send our intention, as so this is being recorded um, <clears throat> and it's, it's archived. So everyone who watches this is going to come to this segment and we're all going to send our intention back to this moment. And we're going to try to influence the electrical properties of a vial of water against a control. And so what we're demonstrating here, we're trying to demonstrate is what we were just discussing about teleology. That is to say, can we receive meaningful messages from the future that affect something now? Okay. So... I have in my hands here, my hands. <clears throat> so this is a device called uh, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. And it's a mouthful. All it means is that it's an electrochemical measurement tool that looks at the conductivity of water, the impedance to be specific, but think of, the, think of it as the conductivity. And you've got a sample and you've got a control. So this is both yeah, uh, distilled right. water. Yep, this is uh, distilled water in each of these vials from the same source. And you've got electrodes that are attached to this machine. And it's going to send a frequency, uh, like a frequency at 10 hertz, 20 hertz, 30 hertz. And it's going to measure the resistance 
in each of these samples and it's going to plot it together. So the resistance or the electrical characteristics should be the same for both samples, right? Okay, and I ran a calibration and they are. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick one of these, red or black, and we're all going to send our intention back for a couple of minutes to make whatever vial we choose more coherent. Okay, why more coherent? Because the, when the molecules in the water become more coherent, that is to say more organized, uh, more structured, that creates increased electron mobility, uh, meaning voltages can pass more easily in the structured water versus the chaotic unstructured water. And we should be able to see that uh, on the graph of the, uh, the conductivity, okay? So here it's 550 um, on Thursday, May 19th. In California. Right, in California, PSD. So <clears throat> we're gonna turn this on and I'm gonna start recording for a couple of minutes and we can discuss something else while we do that. Are we gonna pick red or black or? Yes, okay. I'll give you the honor. Uh, we're gonna, Stendhal's the red and the black. Okay, we're gonna go with red. Okay. Okay, we have picked red and we're going to see if our intentions during the next time, during this, during this following time, will make the impedance or the resistance in the red vial less. Okay, so we'll give this, we'll give this three more minutes. Now, the only people who are know anything about this right now are you, is me and you. Correct. But if you're, you know, if you're watching a year from now, just send your intention backwards in time. And to we're going to, and we'll see if you will be recording something more than maybe what we would do in just this minute. And we'll see if that goes up, if the impedance or resistance goes, goes down, I mean, in the red vial. Exactly. All right. I'm watching it unfold. Okay. Um, so let's talk about something else. Uh, and we have that kind of relatively in the back of our minds. The red is pretty bright in my mind, even as we talk. Uh, but how can technology assist our understanding and utilization of meaningful coincidences? <clears throat> A number of ways. So the first way that technology can help is by reminding you to pay attention. Um, I have a meditation app on my phone, which reminds me to meditate. And so I do a lot more meditation. Uh, when I have a dream journal next to my bed and I am in the habit of recording my dreams, well, when I'm in the habit, I have more dreams and I, I remember my dreams and my dreams become more useful, okay? So we wanna come up with a way to assist paying attention, waking up through synchronicity via technology. So there's one way that I'm working on doing that. Um, <clears throat> I think it'll evolve from here. Uh, I, I'm working on a project. I've been working on it for years. It turns out to be very, very difficult, but um, actually I've been making some good progress this month. Uh, it's a mobile app. And this app, once downloaded, will give you access to a data stream of a real quantum random number generator which is just a way of saying it's a, it's a random bit stream. You get ones and zeros. And a computer will be looking for statistical deviations above chance in your data stream. And when there's a significant deviation, call it odds against chance of one in 50, something like that, meaning there's more ones than zeros over a given predefined time range, it will send you a notification. And that notification will tell you that your your data stream is high, or let's say that your consciousness is high in this moment. I've been beta testing something like this for a long time, for about 10 years in different ways. And I found that these spikes are deeply correlated uh, to what I'm doing or thinking at the moment. Um, for example, about 10 years ago, uh, there was a company called Cyleron, and me and some friends that were also part of the Pair Lab uh, took a couple years out of our life and we just created random number generator 
technologies to explore these uh, fun things. So one of the things we came up with was using, it was a service uh, that sent messages to you, um, to your you know, sort of texted you messages based on uh, this random number generator. And we found that these arrived when we were talking about the system that we built. Um, when we were, I, so here's a story. Um, I was thinking of renting. So let me suggest that before you tell the story, that this is uh, an analog of what the Pear Lab was doing. Yes. What you're doing. And just flesh that out for our, our viewers. How this, it, it's like you're um, Princess Diana. It's, it's like your mind is Princess Diana. But I, go, go ahead. and I'll, make, I'll explain that a little bit more. Okay. So the, the Pear Lab was it set out to kind of explore the nature of consciousness. Um, they're famous for this experiment involving a random number generator, which is a physical device, kind of like an electronic coin flipper produces a string of heads and tails okay but except the heads and tails are ones and zeros and the ones and zeros are representations of uh, physical phenomena typically a quantum physical phenomena so it's a, it's a good randomness source in other words and an individual is asked to using their intention make the machine output more ones or more zeros and they do, and this is a great experiment because there's no reason in the standard model of physics why this should be possible, and yet it is possible, and it's it's a fairly repeatable effect. Um, there's some aspect of intention or consciousness that is shifting the output of the random number generator in the direction of intention. That's okay. so amazing, really. It really is. It's such a simple experiment, and the, the implications are so profound. Um, now you can, okay, so once they had sort of established that, then um, you, know, you can move the random number generator and the, the operator, the individual who's being tested uh, far apart and the effect persists. Um, so it doesn't seem to be dependent on space. Um, at some point after that, uh, Roger Nelson and Dean Radin were discussing what we're discussing and they had the idea to set up multiple of these random number generators around the world and to have their data being logged and sent to a central server uh, to see if there's any correlation to events that happen worldwide and indeed there was so most famously of course in september 11th the output of the uh, i think 50 or 70 nodes at that time random number generators um, essentially all became covariant meaning they all tended to produce uh, anomalies that were similar to one another. And this happened, this began to happen before the first plane struck. So it kind of suggests a presentiment effect. Um, and there's a, a large database now of many world events from sporting events to the death of Princess Diana and so forth, <clears throat> predefined events that fit a certain criteria that correlate uh, pretty well with the output, cumulative output of all these random number generators on the network. Now, what does this mean? Well, that's being debated. Uh, one interpretation is that global consciousness is something like a field uh, and the random number generators are sort of maximum entropy devices that become more ordered or less entropic, more syntropic uh, when there is mass attention or mass emotion that's happening somewhere on the planet. And you're sort of, sort of like, like a thermo, like a, like a a thermometer, I guess, measuring the, uh, uh, the temperature of global consciousness. Okay, mm -hmm. that's one perspective. It's not really my perspective. Another perspective is that you've created, you've created a system, a, a global network, kind of like a global experiment, and you're involving multiple people in the outcome of this, more and more people as more and more people hear about it and that the random number generators are behaving somewhat according to expectation, ah. right? And now that's, I'm a little bit more, that I sway a little bit more in that direction. Even with the presentiment for 9-11? Yes. Um, now everyone talks about 9-11, it's, it's a very important, for the Global Consciousness Project, it's a very important um, event. It really kind of launched it in many ways. And for awareness of consciousness at all, 
it's very important that they get. So it could be that we have this sort of effect backwards in time. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's affecting. Yeah. That's yeah. what I'm saying. That's what you're saying. And you know, there's plenty of reason to think that this is going on because we have done a number of experiments, including a couple of very good ones that have shown that this seems to be what's happening. Um, but then you could even have a, you know, kind of a third perspective, which is like, well, if you set out to create this global consciousness project and your intention was to measure global consciousness, well, then you're maybe measuring global consciousness, right? Um, so there's layers of understanding these things, um, but nonetheless, the, the anomalies persist and they're really interesting. And so I, I believe that the next stage of this is where everyone is walking around with their own uh, measurement device in their pocket. <clears throat> And that is contributing not only to a global network of research capability in global con in you know just in consciousness in general, but also in, in a social capacity, but is also getting feedback uh, that's individually meaningful to them. Um, notifications uh, when spikes are happening for themselves or for maybe their network of friends or family, um, maybe for their company, for their city, for the world, and they can start to relate. Um, what is happening in, a, in, in the physical world outside of them to what's happening inside. And also uh, what's happening in their own data and what's happening in data um, among people they care about or, or with whom they, they share some sort of um, collective meaningfulness. Imagine if around the world you had Philadelphia Flyers fans and the Flyers won are they hockey? I don't know. I'm so bad. Hockey, yeah, they're hockey. hockey. Okay, and the, and they they won the championship, the Stanley Cup, right? And everyone who indicated themselves as a Flyers fan, you look at their data all together, and it's all um, it's very good, very coherent, very strong effect. Okay, well, that would tell you that it's not a an emanating effect, right? It's it's not a thermometer, uh, but you're measuring something about shared meaningfulness among people. It's really much more of an informational uh, effect than a, than a sort of a broadcast effect, if you will. That's an example of what you can do with the smartphone approach. Turns out it's actually technically a very challenging thing to do. So it's taken me, in the beginning, it was, it was getting people to care enough to um, donate money to it. Yeah. Um, and. Uh, and, and since then, the world's kind of changed. And now, you know, people are very interested into it. And now it's more on the, 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 the challenging technical side of it, mixed with the challenges of uh, my, own, my own time. But it's coming along. All right. Okay, I'm going to stop the experiment here. All right. Okay. Very interesting. I just closed it. Okay. Well, um, I'll have to pull up the, the data again, but there was a very clear, uh, very clear deviation basically of red. Um, it looked like about, I don't know, 5% difference uh, that tracked. Um, you know, what I can do is I can get a graph of this and send it out to you um, and maybe put it in the show notes or something. Yeah, we can do that. I okay. can do that. <laughs> the future has influenced the present here, at least. Otherwise, I'm going to be fumbling with the. the yeah, we, we we don't want we don't want to have to do that. Uh, we're coming to we're coming a bit to the end um, of this. Unfortunately, this is really fun talking with you, Adam. Uh, it really is. Um, what what I'm concerned one of the things that I'm concerned about is the sixth major extinction of uh, life on Earth that we may be promoting with. Uh, Global warming, not not climate change. We're, we're heating this baby. We're heating this baby up. Is what we're doing. We're, we're us human beings. Words are important. Words set expectations, and that's what we're talking about. So I'm seeing the usefulness of understanding human beings as a collective human organism that's that's destroying the planet. And what you're talking about is, I think, a way that we can begin to consider. Uh, us as part of a collective human organism, that we are acting together in destructive ways. Can we act together in more coherent with our environment and each other ways? And will that affect a random number generator enough to feed us back 
that this is a better way for us to be able to function rather than the one that's more chaotic and uh, destructive? Yeah, I, I think, think, think that the answer is yes. Um, you know, at some level, I believe that we have a self-preservation mechanism. We, where, I hope so, I hope so, yeah. Yeah, and maybe it's all we got. Um, but what that means is that while things can get bad here and pretty bad, uh, it's not gonna be lights out. And there's, you, I think maybe we, we put, our, put our trust in teleology and uh, know that it's not just that we're destroying the planet, it's that we have been doing it and we're awakening to that fact, okay? Just as you mentioned. And so, you know, once we kind of awaken to that fact, which I think you can say we are, I don't know anyone who doesn't want to drink uh, clean water and breathe clean air and realizes that plastic in the oceans and so forth is a real big problem. Um, well, then we can maybe start to relate to ourselves as the only ones who can stop it. And <clears throat> perhaps there'll be a teleological pull from the future that inspires a handful of inventors on behalf of the rest of the planet who come up with solutions. This is very often the case where you have uh, not just one individual, but, or not a group of people in the beginning, but some very odd people uh, whose special gift is so it's almost like the role of the creative, like a, of the artist who digs real deep and comes up with something that is a little strange, but really profound and ends up making all the difference, you know, uh, in, in terms of science and technology. Now, can anything that we're discussing help do that? Well, maybe not directly, but certainly indirectly. Um, you know, I think that maybe in a technology assisted way, you can help put people in touch with the power of their own thoughts. Maybe there's, maybe there's some young men and women out there who are going to invent the things that save the planet. And maybe one of them gets a hold of this app and maybe it encourages them through some sort of positive messages to trust their heart and follow their dreams uh, and to stay true to what makes them unique. And as a result, they end up doing the thing that ha helps them, you know, invent the cure for, uh, for the disease or come up with the exotic energy technology um, or advocate for the justices that they want to see in the world. Um, you know, if we can put ourselves back in touch with our own soul and with the little voice, the little ember of higher purpose that's always there, which I think is the promise of following coincidences, then we can pull ourselves out of this uh, in ways that we couldn't possibly predict how, um, but that, that I, I do believe will happen. That teleological ember uh, you described that's in us mm -hmm. to um, be pulled to a future that's not the one that we appear to be directed towards, but one that's more meaningful to the people and the animals and the plants on, on this planet. Uh, I think the machine for doing that um, we already have, and we're talking about it today. Your app is an aid to it, a ve very interesting aid. The fundamental thing is this, the meaningful coincidences that as you talked about evolution, maybe being influenced earlier by uh, some teleological evolutionary synchronicity thing, uh, process going on, that will, that's going on potentially now, but the difference is that we have free will to say yes or no to it. Uh, that we, I think we have free will and don't have, and we, we have free will and we don't have a choice. We have free will and we must exercise it to the limited degree each of us can. And that ha involves being able to be open our hearts and minds to the, the clues that synchronicity and serendipity offer us about what the future can be for us. Well, that's well said, and I completely agree. And I'm sure that this is the spirit in which you've created the Coincidence Project. It is, and I got to get this down better as we try to get some donors for this thing. <laughs> got to be articulate and passionate, which I am, but to put the heart into the words, uh, as, you, as you know and have had to learn, is not, is not so easy. Uh, Adam, um, I'm so glad that we managed to meet each other. Um, it was a bit rocky to get here, but you were such a delight to talk with. 
Oh, thank you. It was a, it was a fun conversation. I really appreciate it. I'm grateful to be able to have these. Well, thank you. It, it just, uh, I'm glad that we were able to do it. Great. Hey, and before we get off, tell us something personal about Adam besides that uh, actress thing. I like to let people know <laughs> a little something about that you're not a mad scientist. You don't live in Bavaria or someplace. And not Bavaria. <laughs> You know, not yet. In, in Timisoara, anyway, in the Carpathian Mountains someplace. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, hmm, I, I have a, a strange fondness for overweight cats. <laughs> That's what we want to hear. <laughs> like the chubbier, the better. Uh, I get cute aggressions. I just need to, need to pet them. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Thank you, Adam. <laughs> Psychosphere is a mental atmosphere like a hologram of cosmic consciousness.